Hello, welcome everybody to the Omni CV workshop at CVPR 2020, not in Seattle, but from home. And my name is Matthias Niesner, and it's my pleasure to be an invited speaker here, um, talking about 3D scene understanding and how we can use 3D scenes for self-supervision. Um, as you might all know, there's obviously a lot of motivation why we are doing 3D scanning and how and why we want to use this data um, to understand real 3D scenes. And obviously, autonomous driving is a very big driver, um, literally speaking, um, why this research is being propelled so, so much at this point, right? And we, we definitely um, want to do 3D scanning and 3D understanding because we don't just want to have a single 2D image and know what's in the image, but we also want to get, you know, the understanding of the spatial layout. And if you're talking about these cars, um, we all know there's LiDAR sensors on top of it. Um, we see they have these sensors on top, right? We have here um, a LiDAR sensor. And when you're doing a 3D capture with these sensors, you're typically going to get a depth map that looks something like that, right? So you're going to get this point cloud that is kind of in this circular pattern um, around the cars. And this is why we are at the Omni CV workshop here, um, because we want to particularly focus on these types of, of sensors and possibly how, how to use that. Um, however, before we're getting into, into using um, omnidirectional sensors, um, I would like to generally talk a little bit about 3D understanding and um, what our and my research is in this area. Um, we actually don't really do too much work. Well, we do a little bit of work on, on cars, um, but we do actually a lot more work on indoor scene settings. So in indoor scene settings, we typically have scenarios like these ones where um, we have here a 3D reconstruction of a um, of an indoor environment. In this case, that's a, that's a room, right? So here we see um, there's a bed here, right? There's a pillow on top of it. We see a couch here. We see a table here. Um, and these these 3D scans and these 3D reconstruction, they have been obtained um, with RGBD sensors. In this case, it was a structure sensor that um, Occipital makes these. They're Kinect style sensors. They attach to the iPad. Um, you're capturing essentially a series of these RGBD frames. So you have the RGB data, you have the depth frame. And what you would like to do is you would like to fuse all of this information together. And at the end of the day, you're going to get this reconstruction. Now, the idea is these reconstructions you can take now as input to learning methods. You can devise um, 3D deep learning methods um, in order to get you know, a full spatial layout with all the semantic information of the scene. So in practice, you're going to get something like this that looks like that. And, you know, in the history of the last, you know, three, four, five years, there has been a lot of progress um, specifically on this kind of data. Um, first of all, because um, this data became more and more available um, and there was enough quantity available to, to do enough training. Um, but also because, um, you know, neural networks made, um, you know, a lot of progress. We got better and also more memory efficient in terms of doing neural networks also in higher dimensions and not just in images. Um, when I'm talking about understanding 3D scans, um, this, of course, like as a computer vision academic, you always want to publish a paper and then you think about tasks. And tasks is mostly something that is associated with benchmarks and metrics. Um, and you want to, want to be good at these tasks, otherwise you can't publish your papers. But if you're talking about um, the standard task for 3D understanding, what you can do is you can have a class, a label, per voxel, per mesh, right? And um, you, you can figure out for every surface point, essentially, what is the respective class label, right? So it's a, it's a standard semantic segmentation task. Um, you can do segmentation into objects. You can do, um, well, the analog task, what semantic segmentation is doing in 2D, um, get the bounding boxes, right? Um, do the detection here. So we have here um, each individual object gets one bounding box and for every point uh, we know whether this is part of the object in the respective class, right? So in principle, this is kind of similar what, what Coco is doing in 2D where you have instant segmentation. Um, you can do these kind of things in 3D so you know every single label for every voxel um, but you also know which instance ID it belongs to. So you have semantic instance segmentation tasks in 3D. Um, ultimately, of course, this is, you know, more um, a preliminary setting, I would say, in, in computer vision. Um, ultimately, we want to do much more, right? Ultimately, we want to do high-level understanding tasks. We want to do understanding the object functionality. We want to understand human actions. We want to understand how a robot would use a scene, how it could behave like a human and stuff like that. Um, 
we're not quite there yet. There has been a lot of research, um, but for the most parts, we're still struggling with these two tasks because we're not at the point yet where we would say, well, I'm, I'm gonna take um, a 3D scan and you know I immediately understand everything that's in there um, at a reliable enough accuracy. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Now, the first challenge um, that we encountered like, you know, three, three -ish years ago um, was the available data was just was just very limited at this point. Like you had a lot of, um, you know, ImageNet has become a big thing at this time. And for, for 2D um, confidence, we had now, you know, enough training capacity to get pretty good results. But for 3D, it wasn't quite there. There were some data sets that had, either they had, you know, post estimation benchmarks or they had bounding box benchmarks or they had a bunch of semantic labels on the 2D images, um, like in my or so. But the problem was you didn't have like annotations really in 3D. And this was a big, a big challenge because we, we thought, well, why don't we do deep learning in 3D rather than in, in, in 2D? So we get um, a bunch of benefits. So for instance, in 3D, you don't have to learn scale invariance, right? Everything is in metric space. So you need a substantial smaller amount of data to train things. You don't have to train so long. Your networks, ironically speaking, also need a lower number of weights um, in order to achieve a similar performance. So this is something we've been working on for quite a while. We've constructed the ScanNet benchmark. Um, the ScanNet data set um, is essentially a series of um, these 3D scans they've captured with um, the occipital structure sensor. And um, we, at this point in time, we, we went through, um, I would say a very labor intensive labeling process. So we, we turked out a bunch of labeling. So we annotated the scenes in 3D um, in order to get semantic labels, in order to get instance labels directly on the mesh, um, and which means if you have it in the mesh, right, you can also project it into all, into all the frames. Um, and this at the time was um, roughly about 10x bigger than all the existing um, 3D benchmarks, right? NYU was very popular. Um, NYU has a small number, I think 1500 frames that have been annotated, and ScanNet had suddenly like 1500 scenes that were annotated in total, like two and a half million frames or so, right? Um, so this was one of the, the, the first data sets that we focused on directly doing this in 3D. Um, and what I mean by directly doing things in 3D, we, we constructed tasks like 3D semantic segmentations, like give me a vox, give me a, a, a voxelization of a 3D scene, and for every 3D surface point, predict a semantic label, right? So we have here, this is the ground truth, you have here the predictions, you see there's a bunch of points missing, this is where you didn't have annotations, like I think Scanner has like 90% plus annotations, but a few parts are missing, but nonetheless you can train a network with proper masking that predicts you as the semantic labels for these kind of things. And in this case we trained, you know, very simple 3D uh, confnets. Uh, in this case we had um, kind of a sliding window fashion, so for one chunk we predicted the middle voxel column, we run a bunch of 3D convolutions, um, essentially a bunch of resonant blocks on the occupancy grids. Um, and for every voxel, we predict um, a, semantic, uh, a semantic label. So we have, in this case, we have 22 score, fun uh, score values corresponding to 22 different classes. And we do it for 62 columns, uh, 62 voxels in one column at the same time. So that's not, not so important. I'm just trying to say, you know, this is a relatively straightforward extension at this point, what people have been doing in 2D. We can now do in voxel grids and can get, you know, these kind of, the results um, in terms of semantic segmentation. Um, and this was, you know, this was a very naive network. We thought, yeah, the main contribution of this work is more the data. We wanted to establish a benchmark. We have a hidden uh, data set and so on. So in the last years, um, especially in the last, I would say one and a half years, we have seen a tremendous amount of people actually using the data um, and also proposing new methods. So um, I just looked at our, our benchmark website, right? So this is like, um, we see here, the state of the art is currently at, at 0.6, uh, 0.76 IU, um, and you see there have been a lot of submissions. And if I'm scrolling down, I see even more submission. It goes even down further. Um, and you know, it started like this was a paper from us, like two years of the ECCV um, at like 0.48. And you see like this, you know, these numbers they they became much much better. So instead of using um, you know standard volumetric grids, people have been using um, multi-view networks. People have been using sparse convolutions. Um, that are based on hashes. That's essentially what the top methods do right now. And these results got better and better on the semantic benchmark, right? Uh, we've also seen um, on 3D instance segmentation, uh, there's not that many, but there's still a substantial amount um, of submissions that we have seen that also got uh, got better at you know identifying different object IDs and getting a semantic map at the same time. 
Um, now, this this has been quite an interesting research area, and it still is, and I would say it's nowhere near solved. And we see, you know, this goes to like 0.7, but we still have um, yet yet quite uh, some work to do in the research community. So we still have to find better representations. Um, like points were pretty interesting, right? The point net papers um, and these kind of things. Sparse convolutions, I'm a very big fan of. Um, and so on. So there's there's still a lot of stuff to do in order to get good, um, I think, representations, what is the right operator through convolutions in 3D and so on. Um, so this data though, at the time, we created with the structure sensor and it's, you know, this connect-like setting, right? It's very much mimicking what you have. When you have a phone, you go through a room and you get like a, a sense of the environment. Now, we also at the same time, pretty much almost in parallel, we worked um, together with Matterport, um, that's a company that builds these sensors, they are basically the same, very similar uh, type of sensors that you've just seen. They um, they they also a Kinect style, but they put these on these tripods. Um, and what they did is they, they scanned basically real tail um, real estates um, with it, right? Um, and they put these on these tripods, um, and then the tripod spun. The, there are three cameras here: one, two, three, right? They spun them around and did a very similar thing. Um, except now it's an omnidirectional image, right? So you get basically these panorama images. They are stitched together of um, uh, three times for the three cameras, right? Uh, three times six locations. Um, so you have 18 images per panorama. They are stitched together and you get these panel images. And the key difference is when you're doing this not with a human operator, but you're putting these tripods there, the nice thing is um, you get relatively complete scans. So the quality in this case um, was per scan, was maybe a little bit better. You didn't get so many images because you didn't move it around, um, but you get also very good alignments because when you do structure from motion on these kind of things, um, you don't have to fight with things like motion blur and so on because the camera basically stops whenever it takes an image and so on. So these kind of data sets, they give you roughly these kind of reconstructions and you see they are spatially very large. They basically scan entire buildings. Um, this is how the meshes look like of entire houses. So you have multiple floors. Um, it took quite some effort to get these scans. So the, the Metaport operators, they had to go and put these tripods in many, many locations um, in order to get these scans. They, um, you know. um, and we took the data in the same way we did the scanner data. Um, we, we separated it first into rooms, and then we also obtained dense semantic annotations with you know, a, a pipeline um, that is based on a series of Turka annotations and then with many other verification. Essentially, here we mostly the authors of the Metaport 3D paper ended up doing a lot of annotations. So we had to go through quite some hassle to get there. Um, but at the end of the day, we were pretty happy with the data we obtained. Um, now we have this kind of omnidirectional data. Um, visually, it looks something like this here, right? So we have normals, we have 3D scans, we have the, the, the colored point cloud to it. Um, and at the end of the day, we have something like uh, 10,080 panel images. Um, and each panel image is like these three times um, six, right? So it should be 18 per few, I think. So get roughly to like 200K uh, images, it's, a, it's 90 buildings, and it's quite a sizable amount of data. And what we have is we have both semantics as well as the instance IDs for all of it. And at this point, we realized this was kind of the second effort we've done there. Um, we realized, well, it's, it's actually quite quite a lot of effort to, to do semantic understanding tasks, right? You have to put in uh, a lot of effort, many labor in order to get these labels. And I'm sure this is well known in the community, you know, that machine learning methods, obviously they require a lot of data. Um, but algorithmically, in addition to all the data, we thought maybe there's a better, or there's interesting things we can do with this data that go beyond just, you know, we annotate and train a classifier, right? Um, and the idea is, can we actually use the 3D data for self-supervised learning? So basically, because we now have in metric space, right, we have images that correspond to each other based on the structure of motion methods and so on. Um, based on the 3D models, we know where absolute 3D points are. Um, the idea is, can we actually take this data and can we, you know, derive other paired settings in a self-supervised fashion without having to put the manual annotation? And one of the first things we tried out was, you know, let's learn a key point measure. So let's say we have one of these reconstructions what we know is, this is our reconstruction here in the middle. Um, if we're taking, for instance, this one red point, do you see this one point here? Not my laser pointer, but there's one red dot here on the slide. This point here has been observed from multiple camera images 
that are aligned to the 3D scenes, right? We see it here, we see it here, we see it here, 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 and so on. So, right? so if you see this red dot, it's this red dot. This red dot is the same as this red dot. This one is that one, this one is that one, this one is that one, and so on, right? So all of these red dots from different viewpoints, we know is the same physical 3D point. And why do we know that? Well, we have the alignments of the RGB images with respect to the underlying 3D model, right? And because of that, what we can do now is we can, we can essentially create an arbitrary number of matches, um, which is correlating, take a random point here, check with which other image has seen that point, uh, and then you, you, you kind of extract the surrounding patches here, um, and you have paired patches, you know, this patch here and this patch here, maps to the same point. This patch here maps to the same point, this patch here, this patch here, right? They've all been observed from the same viewpoint, uh, from different viewpoints, but they all are the physically the same point. Now, you can train very simple architectures with it. In this case, we trained a Siamese network, um, similar to, the, um, to 2D MatchNet, I think. Um, and, you know, we had a various, uh, a couple of combinations how to train that. We compared it against Surf and Sift at the time and we realized, well, of course, if you're using a big enough Siamese network with a ResNet50 backbone, we're getting better results than if you'd have a handcrafted feature. But we didn't really care about the network part itself. We cared more about, oh, we get this data for free because we have the 3D model and the respective alignment, so we don't have to manually annotate painful image matches. And this self-supervised idea, this, this can be explained for a lot of other things, actually. And this is what I wanted to continue talking a little bit more about now. So another thing we tried was learning to bring viewpoint overlap, right? So give me two images, tell me how much do they overlap? Well, I get, I get the data again for free because um, if I'm looking at my, at my 3D scenes, I know exactly the 3D pose of each image with respect to each other because I've done structure from motion at some point, right? Um, and I can freely, uh, I can freely take the, the, the estimated six stuff and I can take that one as ground truth and I can predict how much the two images align, right? Very straightforward. We've tried a couple of these things. Um, we've tried to estimate the surface normals, um, right? Of course, if you have then an RGBD, you have an RGBD sensor, you get the depth image with a sensor and you can take the RGB image and constrain it with respect to the ground truth normals that you get from the sensor. Um, and here we show that by using multiple frames at the same time, right? We fuse it together, we have the model basically, um, we can take the information from multiple frames and we can get pretty good estimates of the normals. Um, and again, with pure self-supervision, no manual annotation, we can do normal estimation tasks. And I'm sure a lot of people who work in this area, they know that, right? It's not nothing special anymore. But I think to me, it's still special because compared to all the semantic labeling tasks we had to put in manual effort for annotation for these kind of tasks, um, this is kind of free. So once you have the reconstruction and once you run a structure from motion method, you get the self-supervision for free. So I want to talk a little bit about one specific task, a little bit in more detail. And generative tasks for shape completion. That's a very interesting problem statement. And I would like to explain why I believe the omnidirectional imagery from data sets like Metaport are very, very useful later on for self-supervising the problem. Right. So when I'm talking about, for instance, a generative task for shape completion, what I would love to do is I would like to take a partial 3D model. I would love to run a neural network that predicts me the completed version of that, everything basically I have not observed from the current 3D scan. Right. And obviously the motivation is here to do something like, you know, digitization, content creation and so on. Um, if you want to train a model like that, right? You can also use like, I don't know, we had a paper a while ago, 3D EPN. It's a it's an encoder decoder paper, right? You just have a sim single uh, 3D confnet, takes a voxel grid as input from the partial scan, it's constrained um, with the respective completed model. Um, and a lot of these works in the research community right now, and still up to date, um, they work on synthetic data here because it's very difficult to get the real data. So for instance, um, the, the ShapeNet data set is very popular, right? So this data set has, I don't know, like 55,000 different models, um, something like 50K models, right? We have here the ground truth, 3D meshes, basically. What we can do is we can virtually scan these 3D meshes that create this input here. Um, and then we train a neural network that tries to turn this input into that ground truth. It's not quite that successful, so it ends somewhere here in the middle. 
which is, you know, it's very remarkable what the network can do. But the main reason why the network does that is because we have this paired setting between the input and the ground truth data, right? Um, you see a lot of papers um, that work on ShapeNet today for shape completion, um, for image to 3D reconstruction, and so on. So the reason why that is, is because it's very tricky to get this kind of ground truth data for larger scenes. There's been a few data sets virtually that have worked on scenes, like SunCG is a very popular one. But the, the general problem is a lot of these papers, they all work on synthetic data and don't work on the real domain because there's just not always ground truth data available. So if you're looking at large scenes, it's pretty complicated. If I want to look at a 3D scan and it's a partial 3D scan, how do I know the ground truth? Like I would have to have a perfect 3D scan that doesn't have these kind of holes that you're seeing here, right? Um, so I would have to be very, very cautious when I'm scanning a 3D environment. And anybody who has worked in this area will, knows immediately, well, getting no occlusion and getting completely everything scanned is virtually impossible. Um, so the only thing what people have done so far here is, or the most common approach is, we just train on synthetic scenes and then do some domain transfer, right? Um, the main transfer means, well, we have to figure out kind of a virtual connect sensor that virtually scans a 3D synthetic scene, trains a neural network for shape completion on it, and then transfers this one or applies that model afterwards to a real partial 3D scan, which it then can complete. And we all know it's pretty tricky to, to get, you know, this domain transfer right. But first of all, the, the, the synthetic simulated sensor noise is different than the real noise, right? Um, we also see very quickly that um, our synthetic models, they don't look like real models, right? We don't have the same fidelity in, in the synthetic data sets that are available to the academic community. And it's not even close. If you're looking at a driving simulator, for instance, there's no way like any of these data sets are close to the fidelity of the real world. And it's difficult because it costs a lot of effort to get the 3D assets, um, to get the textures, to get the lighting and everything right. For depth, we have a, at least some chance. For, for RGB, it's completely intractable. So the big question is, if we are arguing that domain transfer is hard and we don't have any ground truth on the real scenes, how can we do the same problem on the real domain? And the answer is, again, we're following a self-supervised approach. Um, so it's the same data what I mentioned before. So in this case, we're using the Matterport 3D data. The good thing is with the Matterport 3D data, we have a Pano image that covers a large space. So we have a lot of, a lot of um, surrounding area actually captured. Now, one thing what we can do is we can take all of these individual depth images, right? These are our depth frames here. Um, I'm going to take these. I'm going to feed them in my favorite reconstruction method. Um, I'm going to get a reconstruction that looks like that, right? So this reconstruction here doesn't look too bad, but you see immediately it has also a lot of holes, like here these black spots or these areas here on the side, right? They are not observed even though we tried pretty hard to get a good scan. And these are the, probably the best scans available on, um, in, in, uh, in this kind of Kinect style setting, right? Of course, you can do laser scans, you get more accurate surface measurements, but you always will end up with a bunch of holes, like behind this, behind this plant, you know, behind this couch, you would have to move the sensor right here. And it's very, very tricky um, to get these kind of, you know, super engineered scans at a large quantity to do any learning on it. Now, the big question is, what can we do if we just assume, okay, we're never going to get perfect ground truth for real scans. So for a real environment, it's completely impossible to get the full perfect 3D model, right? I mean, I can hire an artist to model the 3D model around it, but it's still not going to be perfect. So the self-supervised idea um, is actually straightforward what we did. So what we've done is we said, well, we don't get the complete model but maybe we get a model that is less complete. So what we do is we just we take these two frames and we remove them from the scan. Um, so in this case, of course, if you're only taking these three depth frames that we have here in the background and removing these two in the foreground, we expect that this scan here will be less complete, right? Because we have less data, we have less view coverage. In this case, um, if you're taking only these, we get something like this here, right? So this is our um, yeah our less our less complete. Uh, scan and this is our more complete scan. So we have um, we have two scans. They're both not perfect, right? They're, they're not perfect. 
our goal is still we want to get well pretty perfect scans but even that one is not perfect and we, we expect never to get a perfect scan um, but what we can do is we can make it less perfect that's what we're doing here by removing a bunch of frames so the good thing about the 3d reconstruction methods is if you're looking at volumetric fusion methods is we know which pieces are unobserved right um, specifically what we know is if I have a depth value if I'm taking a piece of paper right so I'm taking this piece of paper here right um, and I can observe the distance here to this piece of paper right from my from my line of sight I know that if I measure this depth point I know the distance to my head and I know that there's no other point in between right this this point might be slightly noisy and off but basically you're gonna get you're gonna have this issue um, that you know everything in front of the surface you know is empty space. That one is known free space. Everything behind the observed depth, everything behind this paper, I haven't seen, right? I don't know. It might be empty. It might be, it might be occupied space. Um, and the idea is that I, I know that, right? In a sign distance field, I would know everything behind it is negative and everything in front of it is, is positive. So everything that is ne negative will be unobserved space. So what I can do now is I can mark all the unobserved space here. This is this orangey marking, right? This is all the piece, all the pieces of the areas where it may be it may be occupied space. It may also be free space. I don't know which one it is because I haven't observed it. I can't tell you more than that. But I can tell you I haven't scanned it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say I don't know about it. I have no clue about it. But now what I can do is I can take this input scan. I can train a neural network and self-supervise it with this target scan. Right, and the idea is that I'm I can go ahead and say this network takes this as input and wants to predict this one as output, except for these orange areas where I don't know the answer. I'm just gonna mask them out in the loss. I'm not gonna predict anything there because I don't know anything better. Right. So if I overfitted a network to do this on this one sample, it wouldn't predict anything reasonable for the orange regions. But the hope and the idea is if I train this network on many, many, many samples, um, I will be able to generalize because maybe locally these areas that are not observed here have been, or similar areas that are generalizable have been observed in other scans and these patterns, these features apply here too, right? So this self-supervision, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and say, well, I'm taking like the whole data set, right? I'm taking the complete scans that are not perfect and incomplete. I'm going to take a bunch of frames out of every 3D scan and make it less complete. And I'm correlating these pairs between incomplete and even less incomplete. Uh, sorry, even more incomplete. So more incomplete, less incomplete, right? But none of it is perfect. I'm going to correlate these two and I'm going to mask out everything that is unobserved space, which I don't know. And now we design a network, which is basically it's an encoder decoder network um, based on, on sparse uh, convolutions in 3D. And now what it tries to do, it takes this input scan here. It's a TSDF, it's a truncated sign distance field. Um, it has an encoder, uh, it has skip connections, and then it has a sparse generative decoder. Um, there's a bunch of details like this in the paper, um, which of course I encourage you to look at, um, that makes it actually possible to do this at a pretty high resolution. So that's why we're also getting good results, of course, at the end. Um, and we have a bunch of intermediate losses here to constrain the problem a bit more. Um, but the key idea here is the self-supervision, right? So we can do this on high resolution geometry because of this architecture. But I think the nice insight is that we're going from less complete, uh, sorry, from more incomplete to less incomplete. And we're masking out everything we don't know. But given that we're training now on so many scenes in parallel, right? Um, we have seen these incompletion patterns all the time. And the hope is that ne this network can now learn how to complete everything because it has seen different patterns across the data set, but it hasn't seen it for a single training sample. So the idea is by training that we can get better results than any of the ground truth samples, right? So the idea is this is a self-supervised idea. We're taking away frames um, to make the problem harder for the network, but we're trying to channelize beyond what is in a single training sample, right? Um, and we show that in the paper and this works surprisingly well, right? Um, because we have a lot of data and we are relatively complete for one sample, um, but we can predict more than each sample individually. And at the end, we get results that look like these ones. So here, this is the input scan, right? Um, and these are our predictions. So you see, well, we're getting pretty good results. Um, it's not 100% perfect, but 
these results here are better than the respective ground truth. You see here the ground truth is missing stuff, right? But we predicted this part here actually, right? And these parts. So we're predicting more than the ground truth in this case, which is super encouraging. And it's very straightforward to do. We just mask out the unobserved space. Um, we compare, of course, quantitatively against a bunch of baseline completion methods. We compare it against simple methods like Poisson. Of course, they're having trouble in the setting. Um, we're comparing against SSCNet, uh, 3D EPN, that was the previous uh, paper, scan complete, that was also a previous paper. Um, and this is an L1 error. So we, we actually quite substantially improve the performance. Um, this one is evaluated on synthetic data. But I think the key is that this one can be trained directly on real data and we don't even need any synthetic data. Um, yeah, we wanted to, I wanted to show quickly another example here on this one here. Um, this is an example with this masking idea and without the masking idea, right? So the idea is if you don't mask in the missing pieces, which we don't know what to predict for, um, uh, then we're getting worse results, right? So in this case, basically everything we have not observed, so we're taking a ground truth sample, right? And everything that has not been observed is still being tagged as empty. So it would, the network wants to predict nothing for stuff it hasn't seen anything. So it predicts you from more incomplete to less incomplete, but it treats the less incomplete one as ground truth. That's what's happening here. And if you do that, you get significantly worse results. If you look here, you're missing a lot of pieces here in the predictions, right? Um, if you compare this part here and this one here, you're missing, right? This one is missing a lot of stuff. Also, again, to clarify, I think this is a really cool example here in the middle. This is the prediction that we get, and this is the respective ground truth sample, right? So the ground truth is significantly worse than whatever we have, we have observed here. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, I, I like that a lot, and I think that's um, pretty nice. So we can kind of use this self-supervised idea, and this works particularly well on this kind of 3D data um, in order to get better, better 3D completions. Um, here's another quantitative metric, which I think is, is kind of cool. Um, so, what we're doing here is we have basically varying degrees of target incompleteness, right? Um, so here we have um, basically we're going to 50% of the frames to all the frames, we're going to 40% to 60% and 30% to 50%. And this one here is actually pretty interesting, I think, right? Um, and these are different metrics, right? This is the L L1 on the entirety of the surface, this is L1 observed space, L1 predicted space, L1 on target. So if you're comparing these three here, um, what this one is saying, this is the default setting that we had uh, at the beginning. We said, well, um, we are going for 50% to the complete scans. And here we're going from 30% to 50%. And what's interesting is they all behave relatively similar. So this case here is pretty impressive because here we're saying, ah, we are going only to 50% of the available frames. So our predictions must be massively better than every training sample individually because we're missing half of the data. We're mi missing, like this ground truth here is as good as the very incomplete one here. And yes, it gets worse evaluation result, but it's actually not too bad. It's not too bad. And I think that's pretty cool. So it's, it's, not, it's not, of course, the, the bluish curve and you have perfect supervision. Oh, it's not perfect, but it's the best supervision gets you better results. But even when we have really terrible ground truth, which is the green one, we're still getting pretty good results. And I think that um, visually you can't see that different. This looks all pretty much the same. So you can look at the paper here at the visuals. Um, and I think that's a very, very nice result. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm, I, I hope I, I could convey this, this, uh, this one main idea. Um, I think it's a pretty nice uh, way what we've done here for the geometry. And um, one of the things we're trying at the moment, we want to do similar things for the color, right? We can do similar ideas um, with 2D reprojection errors and stuff like that. And we hope that eventually um, we're gonna get even better reconstructions. Um, with that, I would also like to come to the end of the talk. I would like to conclude. Um, there's of course a high level theme in these generative models, right? Um, this is the thing I'm often, I'm often saying, this is my dream. Um, this is currently what we are working with in, in computer vision. Um, yeah, I think this one is LSD slam here. This one is Kitty. Um, this one here is one of our non-rigid methods with, uh, with Microsoft together, what we did a while ago. This one is Bundle Fusion. Also, yeah, it looks all computer vision. We are very excited about this, but when I show this to my, to my non-research friends, they tell me, eh, it doesn't look so good visually speaking, right? Um, and all, all, all my friends who are in computer graphics, they're showing me images that look like these ones here. Um, 
And they look actually pretty good in computer graphics because you know what happens there. They have um, they have artists and so on um, that actually go ahead and, and and model all the assets, and then you can use state of the art rendering method and get pretty good results. So they look pretty photorealistic. So the holy grail here, I think this is my dream. I would love to go ahead and turn all of these images in computer vision into nicely looking graphics images by using these types of, of generative models with these kind of self-supervised um, idea that we that I've just described. We've done a lot of progress now on the geometry. Textures, lighting, and material, still very tricky. But I, again, I think the self-supervised ideas, and this is I encourage everybody to think about, um, is, is a very, very nice uh, direction. Um, yeah, I would like to thank um, everybody who worked actually on the project. I'm, you know, I'm just here recording the video and talking about it, but these are the people um, who have done most of the work. I guess Angela has done um, the majority here of the papers. Um, yes, I guess sadly, a lot of people now move to industry and they, they left the universities, but um, uh, I hope most of them are still uh, engaged in research. Um, and I was very fortunate um, uh, to share some of the results that all of these people have been doing. Um, yeah, with that, I would like to, to thank you for the attention. Um, and I guess typically there would be a, a Q&A part of the talk, um, but I hope we can do this in, in a live session um, during the actual workshop day. So yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the talk.